just like we did in JavaScript, we're going to be inheriting from classes. And that specialization that we get from inheritance is how we build things like models. Um, you know, you'll remember that that's probably one of the most important examples of where we inherited from a class in unit two and three uh, when we were building our Mongo uh, mongoose models. And we would import model from or we would import mongoose from mongoose. And whenever we would compile and export our model for use, we would use that doing mongoose.model, which is you know an object that exists on the mongoose object that we got from the NPM package. So by using that as um, essentially a way to build a new schema, remember we used the new word and then schema, that gave us all of the methods and properties associated with the mongoose schema. And that's really how we used classes in unit two and three, like that sort of usage where we would import some class library or, you know, package somewhere with NPM. And then we would instantiate one of those classes or schemas or whatever um, to accomplish some purpose in our app, right? There wasn't a place where we ever wrote our own brand new class to use. Um, and that's kind of what you're going to see in Python. There aren't going to be situations where we go like custom writing our own class because there's really not a lot of use for that in what we're going to be doing specifically. If you were to build a game, like a more advanced game in Python, you would absolutely use something like that. Like if you were to build Minesweeper, for example, Minesweeper is one of those games that just like screams, hey, you should be using classes for this uh, because a class... What's the purpose of a class again? What's a class's job? Michelle, you built Minesweeper, so you can't answer this. What's the job of a class? Um, kind of, I've always kind of used them as like objects, to be honest. Yeah. It's to build objects, that's it. The class's job is to stamp out copies of a new object or new instances of an object. That's it. <laughs> a, a, the class is a blueprint, blueprint for an object. So when we inherit from cl those classes, we get all of the methods and properties associated with the thing that we are inheriting from. Uh, and that's really how we're going to use them in Python. We're going to be using them for Django models, for example, where we import a Django model, and then we are able to instantiate a new class instance of that. And that's our model. Like we're going to build a cat model. And to build a cat model, we have to inherit from Django.model, which you're going to see when we eventually get to there. I think that's next Monday or next Tuesday. So um, yeah, it's good stuff. Anybody have any questions on that? Why we're going to use it? The important reason I'm bringing this up, just to preface that, is so that you don't freak out because there's some code in here that's like a little bit more complicated. There's just some weird methods that you haven't seen before that you don't need to memorize because we're not going to touch them until we get to them in Mongoose or in uh, Django. And when we do get to them in Django, it's going to be, this is just how you set a model up. Like you don't have to memorize how to do it. It's something you're going to see used over and over again. So Rich? I'm curious, what about Minesweeper uh, Screams class? Um, you need a bunch of different squares. Each of those squares have a bunch of properties. Um, has flag, number of adjacent pieces, um, number of adjacent bombs, that you could technically store the position of all of the bombs on adjacent pieces, um, is clicked. Like all of those different properties apply to all of those different squares. And rather than go through and write in your code, make new object, like I want this, I'm setting this up as an object with these properties. I'm setting this up as an object with these properties. The appropriate way to do that is to use a for each loop with a class constructor so that you're stamping out new, brand new versions of those objects before you initialize them to either a number or a bomb. Yeah, that makes sense. 
with something like tic-tac-toe, could we have used classes? Sure. Was it really necessary? Not really. We only had nine squares and they either had a state of X, O or nothing, right? We could have used classes for that, but that probably wouldn't have been a little overkill. Like with Minesweeper, when you have 144 plus squares, tracking those pieces of state individually and like managing those by manually creating 144 different variables, like, nah, bruh, <laughs> that's not what you want to do. So classes would be a great example of doing that. Cool. So the stuff that we're going to, again, the stuff that we're going to learn today in this lesson is not stuff that you're going to need to do for a lab or a lecture. It's stuff that we're going to apply. So Big picture items, more important than nitty gritty, how do I write this code, okay? The same is true for our lecture on SQL later, okay? We're gonna learn how uh, SQL queries work with Postgres. And um, there are, you're gonna see there's a level of complexity to writing a SQL query and we're never gonna do that, okay? And the reason that we're not gonna do that is because we're gonna use Django's ORM or Object Relational Mapper to do all of that work for us so that we can write simple Python code to make queries instead of having great complicated SQL queries. What does that sound like? What did we use in JavaScript so that we didn't have to write wildly complicated MongoDB queries? Just got, got to write nice, easy JavaScript. The connection string? Mongoose. Mongoose. Yeah. Mongoose allowed us to write JavaScript to interact with a MongoDB database. Okay. Django has built into it an ORM. Mongoose is technically an ODM. It's an object document mapper. And um, Django has built into it. We don't even have to specially install it something that does the same thing with relational databases called an object relational mapper. And what that does is it allows us to write simple Python code in order to make queries to the database to perform CRUD operations. It makes doing that a lot easier than having to write complicated SQL queries like you're gonna be doing today in class and for your lab, okay? They're not that complicated, but they're more complicated than what we're going to have to write in Django. And SQL is one of those things where if you want to get into it post-course and like really dig in, probably a good thing to do. But you're only going to have to write SQL queries once in this in this class, and it's for your where in the world is Carmen San Diego lab. But that's this afternoon. Let's start this morning talking about classes. So I'm going to go into our lectures directory here. Make a directory called pi classes, cd into it. Does man need to be sent? Yeah, it should be underscore. Doesn't really matter. I'm just trying to get you used to that syntax, but it doesn't really matter. The other cool thing about this lesson is it's going to feel a whole lot like the lesson we did on classes in JavaScript. So that's fun. Okay. Um, we already kind of answered these questions. But what the hell? Let's answer them again. That sounds fun. Um, let's get the picker out. I feel like that's a nice way to wake everybody up in the morning. Um, what are classes used for? <laughs> Maybe, not Ma Maybe not Michelle. Maybe not Michelle. How about Chia? <laughs> what do we use classes for? Um, 
something for the object. Okay. To create objects, right? Classes are a blueprint to create new objects. Okay. Um, one of the key things that we talked about in object-oriented programming was encapsulation. What is encapsulation? Christina. It's okay if you don't remember. Just take a stab at it. Um... Bundling pro attributes and methods together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is the bundling of related properties and behavior together. Okay. As an example, let's take a look at this dog thing that we're going to build. Okay. We're going to have a dog class that has a name, an age. Potentially, we could put a breed in here. Okay. A dog has a bark method. You know, we could have a walk method for the dog. These are all things, methods and properties, methods and properties that apply to a dog. And the act of putting them all together in a dog class is called encapsulation. Good answer. Okay. Another thing that was very important that I talked about for about a couple minutes this morning was inheritance. What's inheritance? Tell me. Um, <clears throat> any, ob any object that is within a class will inherit the same properties? Yeah. Whenever we instantiate a new object with a class, it inherits the methods and properties of the class that we extended it from. So a subclass that extends another class is going to inherit the methods and properties or attributes and methods of that parent or superclass. Okay. So I think in this example, we have a dog and then we have a show dog. So our regular dog is able to bark and whatever, but our show dog has like prize money winnings and a, I don't know, I forget what the other, like there's a method to like win prize money or something stupid. Like it's a bad example. We need to fix that. But it's just Jim Clark made Winky the show dog. And I thought it was really funny. So I never got rid of it. So um, so I think that's the example we use here. Okay. So inheritance is the ability for a class to inherit the properties and methods of a super class when it's extended into a subclass. Um, I think the picture that we used here was the grasshopper. I don't know if we still, yeah, this, like both bees and grasshoppers are both insects, right? They're specializations. Bees have stingers and they have the ability to gather honey, right? Or pollen. And grasshoppers have the ability to eat grass and chirp, <laughs> right? Um, these are things that are both specialized abilities. But they've all inherited the same things that insects have, right? Exoskeletons and whatnot. Like all of those things come from being an insect. So those things that apply to the superclass apply to both of the subclasses when they are specialized out. But again, bees are different than grasshoppers because even though they're both insects, they have things that make them unique on their own. Okay? That's an in a perfect example of inheritance. Okay. Is it Winky the show dog? Is that what we do? Yeah, we make Winky the show dog. It's exciting. Awesome. I majored in analytical chemistry, so that's pretty pretty damn close um, to biology. Anyway. Um, you you certainly know more things than me, <laughs> undoubtedly. Just giving you shit. Hmm. Um, is it exoskeletons? Is that what insects all have? It's not yeah, number of legs, right. is but, it? Um, I don't think grasshoppers eat grass. They they're hunters. They don't eat grass. No, they hop on it. I mean, I've ne I I can't say I that no grasshoppers ever eaten grass, but they're they are predators. 
they'll fuck anything up that they can eat. Especially their own partners. They eat the heads. Oh, yeah, they eat their own partners. They eat their heads. Yeah, they are ruthless. They are the scariest yeah. insect. Aren't they, like, the same thing? Like, it's very similar to locusts and, like, Plagues wipe out crops. Uh, they're similar to locusts, but they're they they eat the fuck out of other bugs. Yeah. Um, Scary as fuck if you like close up on them. I'm sure so they are locusts. They've just been like it, it's kind of like a mentality thing. They kind of like get it's a high mind. I, I swear to God, it's so grasshoppers are just locusts with that winner's mentality. Grasshoppers can eat up they're to six like times swarming. their body weight in crops each day. Yeah, grasses, not... flowers, and leaves. They're, yeah. I think, vegetarians, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Wait, I think we were thinking about praying oh, mantises, Drew. Oh, I was thinking about praying mantises. Praying mantises. Eat partner's heads. That's what I was thinking of. Trying to troll oh, so, me. Oh, I love God. it. All right. I think the six legs are insects, though. Is it? Yeah, because, like, when you get to eight legs, um, it becomes, like, spiders are arachnids, not insects. Don't don't mind me. I'm a nerd too. Hexapods. So yeah, three main body parts: head, thorax, and abdomen. Yeah, three pa three pairs of segmented legs. I, mean, I know some shit. Yeah. You do. Uh, it's early. I was thinking of praying mantises. <laughs> All right. It's fun times. This is see learning is fun. Um, save that for later. So we talked already about objects in Python, right? Um, everything in Python is an object. And this, this is regards to object-oriented programming, right? Um, what that means is that every variable, every piece of data has properties and or methods that are encapsulated within it, okay? We've seen this already. We've used different um, pieces of data in Python to do different things, right? We have different methods and properties that are attached to those to achieve some purpose or outcome, right? The append method, for example, is something that we have available to us on lists. I, you know, I can prove that here by going to, uh, to make nums equals one, two, three. And we can print and we'll do dir nums. This is a way to get more information about something. Okay. And if we execute this code, we see all of the methods and properties that are associated with nums. Okay. You see here, we've got a bunch of funky looking ones. And then we have append, clear, copy, count, extend, index, insert, pop, remove, reverse, sort. We learned about half of these yesterday. These are methods associated with lists, okay? All of these things, as well as all of these things, come as methods and properties related to a list in Python because it's an object, okay? These other methods are called magic methods, okay? Or dunder methods. They're called dunder methods because they start and end with double underscore characters. Okay. I thought this was a joke the first time I heard it, but it's not. Not because they're related to the author. Yeah. I'm glad we have that joke out of the way now. It's, they're not related to the office. Okay. They're called dunder methods because they both start and end with double underscore. And these are commonly referred to or commonly used to overload operators. Okay. And an example of what we're going to do with this is coming up shortly with the dunder init method. So I'll show you how that works. Okay. If you want to learn more about them, there's a further study on these. We don't really talk much more about these than. I think we talk about dunder init a lot, but I think that and uh, there's one more that we use, the SDR, dunder SDR method. Um, those are the only two that we really talk about, but you can read up more about these if you want later. Okay, So let's write a basic class. We're going to build a dog. 
Okay. Let's start by writing class dog. Notice that we have our custom, or not custom, but our that seafoam green color that was used to, to represent a class in JavaScript. It's the same thing. Okay, get that same color so we can see that that's class here. The naming convention for classes in Python is upper camel casing. So when we make a show dog, it's going to look like this. Okay. Just like we did for classes in JavaScript. Okay. What happens when we call a class? is that there's this method that's automatically called when a new dog is created. Did JavaScript have that? Think back to long, long ago, six whole weeks ago. Yes, with yes. new. Or it was like in, it would be like create new. I can see the lines of code in my head. That's, that's how to, I... that's how to instantiate a class. You're right. But is there a method inside of the class definition that is automatically run every time that this is every time that we initialize a new class, every time I say, make a new dog, there's a method inside of this that automatically runs there, there is. Okay, it's called the dunder init method. And in JavaScript, it was called the constructor. Okay, when we built classes in JavaScript, we had access to the constructor function. The constructor function in JavaScript is the function that would run automatically. I probably said automatically back then, whenever a class is instantiated. So we have this ability to put some code in here that kind of defines how our class is set up. Okay. If we were to go back and look at what classes look like in JavaScript, that's something that looked like this. Inside of our constructor, we would put all of the methods and <laughs> that makes me laugh every time I see it. We'd have all of the methods and properties that we want to want to associate with a car in the constructor method so that we can initialize those methods and properties by taking in arguments from when we instantiate the car. Okay. Again, just to see this, if I had a, a class for car, I would put the make and the model inside of the constructor method inside of the car so that when I instantiate a new car, it would pass Ford and Bronco to make and model and set those up as make and model of my new car object that I used the car class to instantiate. Okay. We already did this. This was unit one. Okay. I'm just showing you this because this is very similar to what we're going to be doing in Python. Okay. Minus Derek Zoolander. But, but I mean, on that note, though, we had this. Right? What is this? Center for ants. In Python, this is self. Okay, that's how we refer to that. So in our dog class, instead of having a constructor method, we have it dunder init method. Oh. 
the Dunder init method accepts all of the parameters, or we set up here all of the parameters that we expect to have arguments match up as when we def when we instantiate a new dog. So I'm going to have, first off, self. You always have to start with yourself, with self, okay? Name and age, okay? Self is the first thing that gets passed to this instructor, or this constructor, this init method, okay? The other cool thing that we can do here is we can specify defaults. So if the user doesn't pass in an age, I'm going to say that the age is zero. Tommy? So if you use the um, the autocomplete for init, it comes up with an arrow saying none and then pass underneath. What do those guys represent? Pass just means don't do anything. It's just a way to stub something up. So it's kind of but like a placeholder. Immediately after self, before inputting name and age outside of the parentheses, it says arrow none. Uh, it's I don't know what the shortcut is for that. Um, you can just uh, type in it. Yeah. Yeah. This is just another a way to do something kind of not really what we're doing. Um, technically, this is saying that. This function isn't going to return anything, but we're not going to use that kind of complicated syntax of Python. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. So we have self, name, and age. And, but we're going to specify that the age here is zero. Okay. This is what's called a default. So I can specify the age of a dog when I create it. And if I don't specify it, the default kicks in. So we're able to use defaults here, just like we were in JavaScript. Okay. Then, excuse me, just like it, just like we did in JavaScript, we have to say self.name equals name, self.age equals age. What did we put here in JavaScript? This, I think. Yeah. It looked exactly like that. This dot make, this dot model. Okay. The syntax here is a little bit different because we again have to pass self here as a parameter in this Dunder init method. So technically, the first thing that gets passed to this method is the thing that we are creating so that we're able to instantiate it with those properties. We didn't have to do that in JavaScript. The constructor already knew to do that. Okay, The constructor knew what this is because of the way that this is bound here. A little bit different in Python. So the things that we use when we instantiate a class are going to come starting at the second parameter position. So when I make a new dog and I pass a name and an age to it, those positions are going to match up with starting at the second argument or the second parameter inside of this function. It'll be the first argument we pass to it, but there's this like weird invisible parameter that we have set up. Okay. So this is the basics for creating a dog. Let's also add a method called bark. Okay. And when we bark, we're going to say print f string self dot name says wolf. Okay. Very important to note. This is indented, okay? This means something very different than this, okay? This is part of the class. This is not. So even though we put a space here, which is perfectly acceptable, 
we know by our level of indentation that this bark method belongs to this dog class. Okay. Fun side question, just off the top of your heads. When we're doing a lesson like this, say that I have the screen right here, would you rather me just like one quick scroll so we can see everything? Or would you rather me go like this and like slowly scroll down as I'm talking? Just. I kind of like it being like with where we are, like where you're talking. I don't know if that makes sense. Right, but with the content currently on the screen, would you rather, like, if I'm going to go from this down to here, would you rather me scroll, like, just once, or would you rather me, like, talk and, like, scroll like this, and so you can't see anything as I'm... I'm settling an argument between David and I. Is there a middle ground? That was a very leading question on the end there. Yeah. Um, There's no middle sorry. ground. <laughs> From my experience, uh, when I had the migraine, uh, the quick scroll was very painful to watch. Okay. Yes. Cool. Not the answer I was looking for, but I appreciate your input. Um, awesome. I'll scroll nice and slowly so that you can't read the lines that I'm going through as I scroll. Um, David and I fought about that for like 10 minutes last night. Um, so as you can see here, I mentioned this earlier, age equals zero is what's called a default parameter. Okay, So if we call this function, if we instantiate a dog and we don't give it an age, the default age for a dog will be zero. Okay. Bark is an instance method. What's an instance method? Is it a method that uh, runs every time there's an instance created? Of that object? It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily run every time. Or it's like it. If I do this and say Ruby equals dog Ruby four, and I run my code, it doesn't run. All it is is saying this is a method that applies to this instance, to this instance. It's an instance method because I can say print. Well, actually, I could just do ruby.bark. And when I run that, Ruby says woof. It's an instance method because it is callable on an instance of a class. Okay, When we invoke a class like this, we are instantiating a class to make a new object, a new dictionary in this case. Cool. What do we not have to use here that we used in JavaScript when we do this? Three letters. Aria, what did we use when we created a class in JavaScript? If I wanted to instantiate a new class, what was the word I used there? Um... We did it when we defined schemas in MongoDB. I could say const my schema equals blank schema. New schema? Yeah, new, exactly. We don't have to use the new keyword here. We just say, hey, Ruby's a dog. Okay. So we get away without having to use that. This self business that we talk about, 
okay? It's this. It's the same thing as this in JavaScript, okay? Every object-oriented programming language must, must have something similar to that because we have to enable a method to access other properties and methods within the same object and enable a single copy of a method in memory to serve any number of instances. I have to be able to write code in here that somehow says that, that this thing that I've created has a name. If I want to enable this thing to be able to print the name of the thing I've established, I have to give it some ability to do that. This makes a lot more sense. Well, I mean, this and self are both great words for that, right? Because self talks about the thing that is being instantiated, the shiny new object that we're creating with this dog, uh, with this dog class, right? So self here refers to the class when it's being created as an object. So Ruby here in this case, when I, when I run this line of code, what happens is this def init, this init function runs. And it passes in Ruby as the name and four as the age. If I didn't pass an, an, uh, four in here, it would default with age is zero. Again, that's how default situations work with these. But this age parameter is going to line up with four. So this will create a new dog that has a name of Ruby and an age of four. And because of the way that we've used self here, we're able to assign name to the self.name property. And we're able to assign age to the self.age property. Okay, and again, the reason that self is important here is because it enables us to do things like this. Okay, if I want to know the name of the dog when it woofs, I have to be able to pass as a, an, well, as a parameter here, but as an argument to that internally, whenever I run this bark method, it needs to know the name of the dog. So I have to be able to use this self keyword to describe the instance of this class that we're talking about. Okay, Ruby is a class instance. It is an instance of the dog class. I have instantiated the dog class to make a Ruby. Okay, Ruby had a birthday. So. I'm gonna update this like all over the lesson, but I don't care. Take a little break, come back. We'll talk more about how this works and what, what the next steps are. Take uh, 12 minutes. So in order to create an object by instantiating a class, we do exactly what I've done here. Kind of got a little ahead of myself with this example, but it, we declare a new variable, just like we do in Python like this, and use the name of the class that we just created, which again is going to be an upper camel case. And then we specify the options that we want to set this up with as argument. So whatever properties that we've initialized on this class using self.name, self.age are passed in as arguments that again, line up to the parameters that we've established for these things when defining the class itself. <clears throat> okay. So if we want to, we can check this out and comment that out. Let's look at ruby.name, ruby.age. And if we print those things out, we see that Ruby's name is Ruby and age is four. Okay, so we've given Ruby a name property and an age property because of the way that we built this class and because of the way that we've invoked this class when we instantiate a new Ruby dog object. Okay, that makes sense. Same thing as JavaScript, essentially. The only difference here is that we're not using the new keyword and that we don't have 
a constructor method. We have the dunder init method, which is essentially the same thing, which is, again, a little bit of a syntactical difference. Okay. The other thing that we'd set up that you can't really see in action here is this default for age. So let's go ahead and make a new dog named Liam. We're going to say Liam equals dog Liam. And when we do that, let's go ahead and print Liam. And when we run that, you'll see, oh, yeah, we want Liam.name, Liam.age. Fun it's a little side note here, because we're going to talk about this in a second. Notice what happens when we print just the object that's instantiated. Okay, We don't get all of the key value pairs. Because of the way that this was instantiated, we get double underscore main dot dog object at this. Does anybody know what that is? Is that the location that the object is stored in? In memory, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what this is? What this syntax is? Oh, two, five, six. Is it a hex code? Yeah. Hex? It's a hex memory address. That'd be pretty dope if our dog was encrypted using SHA-256 hashing algorithm. <laughs> Not that fancy. Cool. Um, but you'll notice when we print Liam, we get the memory address of Liam, which is kind of cool. And we're going to change that here in a minute. That's kind of why I wanted to highlight this, is we're going to override that with something else. But what I meant to demonstrate here, but accidentally got into the wrong thing, is if we print Liam.name, Liam.age, we'll see Liam and zero. Okay. We didn't give Liam an age, but because of the way that we set up the default for this, his age was defaulted to zero. As we saw when we printed out Liam specifically here, we got the memory address. Okay, that's the address which this dog is being stored in memory. Okay, that's an unfriendly output. That doesn't really do us much good. Okay, but what we're able to do is we're able to override methods that are attached to this object from the class and make them do something more useful. We're actually going to do this quite a bit, especially in Django, where we have the same situation, where we're looking at something that we've instantiated, and it's going to give us this weird, like, oh, it's a cat object. It doesn't do us any good. So what we can do is we can override the result of printing this thing out by changing what happens when we print the object out. And to do that, we can manipulate what's called the Dunder STR method. So underneath this, I'm going to write def Dunder STR self. And I'm going to return f string dog named self.name is self.age years old. Now, when we print the name of the dog, we get something useful. Okay, So what we've done here is overridden what happens whenever we print an object that's been instantiated by a class, which is pretty freaking cool. Okay. All of these Dunder or magic methods have different abilities. They all do different things. We're only going to really uh, realistically talk about two of them. The init method, which is used to initialize the new properties of an object, 
that's spit out by a class, and the STR method, which gives us a usable chunk of information whenever we print the details about an object that was instantiated by a class. Tommy? Sorry, could you go over that again? What is the Dunder STR method doing exactly that's different? Sure. Dunder STR technically already exists on this object. Okay. When we run this print method, if look, I'm going to comment this out, pretend it doesn't exist. When I print Liam, this is the output of the Dunder STR method. This is what it does it prints that this is a dog object at this memory address. That's its job. But this doesn't do me any good. I can't use this to do anything useful. None of this information does anything for me. So what I can do is I can say, you know what? I'm going to make that method do what I want it to do. I'm going to redefine how this method works by just saying, actually, it does this. Okay. Technically, you can do this in JavaScript, too. If you wanted to rewrite the way that sort works on an array, you could go into the array class and overwrite how sort works. You could add your own custom methods to the array object. So this, it would work in the same way if you did print Ruby right now. Yeah. OK, so it's it's like a default kind of thing. All right. Because I was like wondering, what's the difference between just doing that for Liam, but that sets it up so that it does it for all classes. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Because it is a class method, or it's an instance method. So it works. That's why we define this specifically as an instance method. I'm glad you brought that up. Because these are methods that work on every instance of a class that's been instantiated. Pretty cool. Again, I showed you this. You could do this in JavaScript, too. I know you probably don't remember it. This has been forever, and we didn't really write classes manually very often. But this works the same way. If you want to overwrite classes or override classes that are or methods and properties that already exist within objects in JavaScript, you could totally do that. Now it's time for an exercise. Fun exercise because we've done this before, just in JavaScript. What I want you to do, I'm going to give you 15 minutes for this, is I want you to define a class named vehicle. You're going to give it a vin, a make, a model. Running is going to be an attribute for maintaining whether or not the vehicle is running. This should be set to false within the dunder init method instead of being passed in at the time of instantiation. Okay. This is a little tricky. You're going to have to figure this out. That's why I'm giving you 15 minutes. You should also have a start method for changing running to true, and you should have a stop method for changing running to false. Test it out by instantiating it a couple of times and calling the start and stop methods. Okay. There's an example of exactly how to do that. If you write this code perfectly, if you copy and paste this into the terminal, you should see false for the output, true for the output. And you should be able to see essentially all of this stuff. Okay. I also want you to override the Dunder STR method so that it returns a string formatted as vehicle, and then the vin in parentheses is a make model. So if I printed car here, I would see Vehicle TS123 is a Tesla Model S. We cool? Cool. It's a 15 minute. I'll see you shortly. Actually, you know what? Let's go to the picker. The picker served us well. The picker knows all.
some of you are already safe. So what you are asked to do is to define a class named vehicle with the following members or properties and methods, and then instantiate it to test out that it worked. So Rich, you wanna show us what you got? It's like every day is the price is right with the picker. I feel like it always picks me. That's what everybody always thinks. No, I picked me yesterday twice. No, like three days in a row already. Yeah. Well, there's only 14 of you, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So well, I almost got it. I, I was just looking at it right now, and I almost figured it out. I think I'm supposed to put right here car as well. No, start. I think that's what I said in motion. Um, running. Dot running. I don't know. Yeah, print car dot running and see if it's true or false. And then running right here as well. Or I mean, sure. What I would do is no, no. print car car dot running and then put you have thirty four there car dot start so move thirty four down after thirty eight. Move 34 down to 38. Well, now, yeah, just put it anywhere after 37 now. Anywhere after 37, okay. And then print car dot running again. So change 40 from print plane to print car dot running. Car dot running. And what that'll do is that'll show us what car dot running is before starting it and then after starting it. And you should see false trip, which is perfect. Okay. Um, you might want to change one thing though. You want self dot make self dot model. But other than that, this is fantastic. This is great. Oh yeah. So I just instead I was running out of time, so I was just copying and pasting. No, you're good. I love it. Okay. Cool. While we have this shared before you stop, Tommy, did you have a question? It's not working for me. Excellent. Let's check it out. You. Thanks, Richie. A nice work. Okay. So, what is line twenty seven doing? Actually, the, it's the same problem I had, and I I know what the answer is. That was me just testing something out, but it's not doing anything technically. Okay, so let's see what you've got here. Ooh, Hello. this is a good Actually, one. Start. This is a good one. This is a good one. This is Python being a little bitch. So what happened here? Rich, you uh, said this happened to you. What's the issue here? Um, indentation. Yeah. You've indented this too far. This oh. should be on the same level as your other uh, definition, your as okay. your other function. Took me about half the time to figure that out. Wow. <laughs> That's fun. That's that will make so you a master's dumb. of indentation. Yeah. So, what? By the way, <laughs> okay. I had the same problem, and that's actually so annoying. I was so confused why it wasn't working. Wow. Yeah. This wow. is good stuff. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. Terrible. Cool. Awful. Nice work. Anybody else? Awesome. Um. Um, all right, Aria, what do you got? Uh, I just had a quick question about, you know, the uh, def init method. Do you have to pass running in there or it's just fine to like define it beneath it? Defining it beneath it is actually the better option here because if you were to define it in where you pass it in the dunder init method, it would 
allow the user to specify something when setting it up. So here, let me let me write this out. I'll show you the difference here. So when we write this out, okay, we're gonna print. Uh, let me get rid of these. Wah, 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 wah. So we're going to write class vehicle. And we're going to put, uh, what, what did I say? Def thunder in it. Self. Is it self and then the other things, right? Yeah. Self, then make model. We're going to leave running out. And the reason we're going to leave running out is because I want to define running somewhere else. And okay? I want to just, I want every car that I create to, for running to be false. Okay. When I create a new car, when it rolls off the lot, it's not running. Right. Or when it rolls off the factory line, hopefully it's not running. That'd be pretty terrifying. Right. If we built a car and it was running when we finished building it. So we don't want that. So we're going to leave that out. And then what we'll do is we'll put self dot vin equals vin self dot make equals make self dot model equals model and self dot running equals false. That way, every new car we create is not running. Okay. Then we need a method. Yep. Not a problem. Uh, Rich, do you have a question before I keep going? Uh, you might be about to answer it. You can keep going. Thank you. Okay. So after that, let's put this next method. F, uh, what was it? Start. That needs to accept the self parameter. And we can say self.running equals true. So that flips it. So when I run the start method, it will start the car. I also need to add, as per the instructions, a stop method that changes self.running to false. So now I have a method to start and stop the car. Okay. So let's try it out. Let's say that we have car of, or let's say car, then fast car equals, uh, what was the first thing we need to pass it? Vin, make, and model. So let's pass it to Vin, uh, fast, uh, nine, 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 nine. And it is an Acura NSX. Okay. And then what we can do is we can print Ben fast car dot running to see if it's running. Okay. Then we can print. All right, instead print, we'll do Ben fast car dot start. We can print Ben fast car dot running to see if it's running or not. Ring. And then we can print or do Ben fast car dot stop. Yeah. We'll put that one more time. And if we run this, I spelled something wrong here. What did I do wrong here? Tuple object has no attribute running. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I need to actually say dog or uh, vehicle here. I was about to say, why am I not getting all my linting properly? So you'll see here that first, when I run this, it shows false because I've initialized it as false. Then I start the car and print again, is the car running? Yes. So I stop the car and then print again, is the car running false? So 
So that's how that works. Okay. What is your crest for your question? Apparently I didn't answer it. Um, it's still a little fuzzy in my head. Hopefully I can ask this correctly. So the way we're setting this up so far, all the uh, parameters that you put in after init, um, they all, just like normal functions, they all have to line up with um, arguments we're going to ask or we would pass through later. Mm -hmm. As if you, uh, like under that, that init list for vehicle, what if you were to add, I don't know, three more properties like self.color without passing in a parameter? Can you, uh, can you not, what am I trying to ask? Can you access properties that you create even if you're not passing the matching uh, or uh uh, oh no what am i trying to ask if you if you know what i'm trying to ask finish my question for me uh yeah can we access that later if you don't put color up in that parameter list mm -hmm. you can access it you can change it right now if i were to print benfastcar.color you'll see that it's lime green and it will be lime green for every car that we create because we're not able to specify that when instantiating a new car using this constructor. Okay. But if I want to change that later and say, Ben fast car dot color equals, um, I don't know, forest green. Now it's forest green. Cause it's just an object or dictionary in this case, I can change the properties of it, but it's initialized to this. And this is the way that we've set that initialization up. If I wanted to make it so that that was a, a parameter, I could add that in here and say that every new car is by default a specific color and less specified when defining it. But yeah, you could totally do that. Gotcha. So the parameters are mainly to enable uh, to enable us to set up um, the term you just used two seconds ago. Of it, I, I understand now, even if I don't have the words for it. Thanks. Okay, cool. By the way, if every student I ever had in this course chipped in, I think it'd be less than a couple hundred bucks a person. You could buy me a 2023 Acura NSX. They're only like 170 grand. So, and You're I like spend 170 grand on an Acura. Have He's you seen not. He's like, no, no, no. You but, guys are gonna. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Acura NSX. Is it's a beautiful car. I don't know if I've ever seen that. Is it? Is it actually nice? Yeah. Um, I'll have to there. check it out. Anyway. Um... There you go. <laughs> yeah, this is the 2022. They stopped making them in 2023. That, that, that's hot. Maybe it's like having a Lambo, but not spending spend like the cost millions of a house of dollars. on an Acura. I mean, again, I'm not spending this money. You are. Right, so, we are. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, of course. Makes a lot more sense. Yeah, they stopped making them in 2023, too. So now they're like even more like everybody wants them. So. Yeah, this everybody. Is, yeah, Everyone this is the one that I I drove. It was like a '95, I think, when uh, my, one of my sister's boyfriend's dads had one. Or well, my sister's boyfriend's dad. He didn't have multiple dads, but uh, he had almost the same one. And I got to drive it like all aluminum frame, so it's like driving a soda can. Like if you get in a wreck, you're done. But man, those cars are fast, and they're approachable. Right? It's not like a Five hundred thousand dollars sports car because that that would be that's yeah, too much for a car. Just one hundred and seventy thousand. That's like so yeah. much more affordable. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh boy. Yeah. Cool. We all feel good about this. Uh, I forgot to do the last part here, which is uh, um um. Uh, we have to do the def dunder str right, uh, where we take self. And return f string. What do we want? Vehicle. Let me Vehicle do the fin. Vehicle is a make model. Yeah. Oh. Is a self dot make self dot model. The R8's nice too. The Acura or the Audi. I'd take one of those. 
Um, let's go ahead and print Ben fast car. And you'll see that now it says this. Uh, so I had one um, question too, real quick about the. Uh... There's the R eight. Sorry, <laughs> your question. It's okay. I, I do like Audis um, that more than Acuras. No offense, but um, the when I made it, I did um, self VIN make model and then running equals true as arguments to be passed, and then I did running was running down in the uh, below that. And then it worked the same. So, so my question is running Google's true up here. Yes. Yeah. Um, you first off, the, we wanted you to make it running Google's false. So if you're gonna do that. Or I'm sorry, I meant yeah. running equals false. That's what I meant. The problem with that is that if you do that, your user would have the ability to create a new or or not necessarily your user, but you would be able to specify when creating a new vehicle that the car is currently running. We don't want that. Right. Right. Okay. So that, but, that would um, be the difference in how you did it and how I did it. Right. But uh, it worked. Otherwise, it worked the same. And uh, the only difference there is if it's a property, you don't want to, you want to be one way when you make it every time you don't want to include it up there, like you said, for rich. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, let's talk about class versus instance members. Okay. Uh, actually, why don't we take a quick break and then we'll finish this lesson up with the rest of this stuff. Uh, come back in 10 minutes. Wait, before you all leave. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I need for you all to check something. So... Just like we talked about class methods and instance methods in JavaScript, we also have the same thing in Python. Okay? There's this idea that we can put methods into a class that are only accessible by the class itself. And we can put methods into a, or methods and properties that are only accessible by instances of the class. Okay, And I realize this can be confusing. And again, it's not something that we're actually going to be actively using um, because we're not going to have a reason to do that here. But what I want you to think about here is what information is necessary for the individual class to know and what information is useful for an instance of the class to know. And that's where things like this ID property come in. Okay, If I want to assign a class attribute to something, I can do, well, let's just as an example here, go back to our dog, um, which I still have. So I'm gonna comment out my vehicle stuff. Let's go back to our dog example, okay? Inside of our dog, I'm going to put class dog, and I'm gonna put a variable here called next ID. equals one, okay? And what I can do is inside of this init method, I can put self.id equals dog.nextid. You with me so far? So just defining a variable inside of this class, hey, the next ID is gonna be one, and then whenever we initialize a new dog, we're saying, hey, its ID is going to be whatever this value is. And then after we've set it, bump it up. Plus equals one. Okay. What we've just done is added an automatic numerical ordering system. To our dog, to our dogs, so that every dog has its own unique ID. Okay, I know obviously MongoDB has a fancy way of doing this because it uses the you know virtually unique properties with the object ID. But look at what we've just done. If I print 
ruby.id and liam.id, you'll see that I've now given each of my dogs a unique ID. Okay, This next ID is something that's only accessible from the class itself. Okay, It's a piece of information that's stored in the class as my code is running. I can't say print ruby.nextID. That doesn't work. Okay. Well, tech, I guess technically I can, but I can't really do anything with it. Okay. And it's not actually accurate either. Okay. Why is that not accurate? Is the next ID with Ruby three? Where the hell is that three coming from? Why is that a three? I'm confused. Somebody help me. Is it because it was stored in memory and now it's just being updated? It's coming it, from here, right? Sort of. Um, Ruby was initially set as one, and then we made Liam. And so when we do ruby.nextid, I guess it's jumping the two and going to three. Yeah, it's looking at this, but it's looking at the dog property or the dog class. It's not technically looking at Ruby. Okay. It's looking at any, like if I were to do liam.nextid, it would say three, two. I'll prove it. Okay. Technically, it's looking at dog.nextid. It's looking at the next ID property that will be assigned to any dog. Okay. This information doesn't persist in an instance. It persists on the class, okay? Technically in JavaScript, if you tried to do this, it would error out. It would say, you can't access that. But in Python, it's kind of weird because we can access that next ID property, even though we can't, it doesn't really have anything to do with the instance of the class. It has to do with the class itself, okay? The instance of the class has ID accessible as ID, which is why if we try to cons or print this, doesn't work. Dog doesn't have an attribute ID. An instance of a dog has an ID. Dog itself does not. Dog has a next ID. So this, this variable, this data is accessible primarily by the class. It's accessible by instances of the class, but that's not really why we would want to use it because it's not going to be an accurate representation of what that data actually means in this context. I know that that's confusing AF. I get it. But think about the application of this. This isn't something we would do. We wouldn't need to access ruby.nextid. This isn't something we would need to do. But this is very useful because this gives us the ability to automatically increment an ID and associate it with a value. Okay. If, if we didn't have um, an ORM or an ODM, to submit data to our database and have everything work properly and auto increment those values when storing data into a database. Like if MongoDB didn't assign those unique IDs and if SQL didn't have auto incrementing integers, which you're gonna learn about later today, we would have to find a way to put a new value with every piece of data we create. So I uniquely identify it, right? This would be how you do that, okay? If we were creating a whole bunch of data and wanted a unique piece of information associated with that data, you would use a class method to do that instead of an instance method. But I mean, technically you tie the class method to the instance method like we've done here. It's pretty cool. Again, we're not gonna use this, but it's really neat to know that you can do stuff like that. And there's a lot of stuff we haven't really talked about with objects and classes like getter, getter and setter methods that you really should look into post-course. There's a lot of really cool shit you can do with objects. Okay. You can lock down the ability to set and get different properties of objects. Like you can make it so that it's not accessible within code. You have to have special code to do it. It's 
really fascinating stuff. We just don't get into it because it's first off in unit one, very confusing. Um, and two, there's not really a need to do that in the applications we build, but a lot of your games can be hacked. If you use objects and arrays, like you can type something into the console and hack your games. If you were to write code using getters and setters with objects, you could prevent that from happening. Because you could make it so that certain things can only happen during runtime and not necessarily be manipulated by someone who's got access to a console, which is how things like that are protected out in the real world. We just don't get into that because we don't have the time. And if I showed you that in unit one, your brains would have melted. Okay. The other thing we can do here is we can add another method to the class and have it be an actual class method. And we can use what's called a decorator. Okay, we're going to get fancy, decorate our class. Okay, we're going to put at class method. This is called a decorator. We're going to write def get total dogs. CLS here represents the class. We're going to return class dot next ID minus one. What does that do? What that does is it allows us to see how many dogs we have created. So we've created Ruby, we've created Liam. If I print dog dot get total dogs, you'll see that I have two dogs. If I create Ruby2, Liam2, now I have four dogs. Okay, This class information is only accessible because of the class method we wrote. Okay, If I try to print Ruby, dot get total dogs, what happens? Same thing. Not really useful to do it that way because that doesn't really make contextual sense, but it's looking at the class. It's looking at the dog class to see, okay, cool, Ruby is a dog. This is a class method that exists on dogs. What does that give me? And it looks at wherever the class is currently at with next ID, and subtracts one from it. Because if the next ID is five, that means I have four dogs already. So when I create a new dog, it's ID will be five. Just math. Okay. So when you define a class method, there's only two differences. One, we use the class method decorator. Decorators, by the way, are used to implement metaprogramming which is when a program has knowledge or manipulates itself. Okay. Python decorators are used to modify the behavior or function of a class. You're going to see that. We're going to enable auth in our applications. You know how we had to, all this crazy code to put to protect routes and to use auth in unit two and unit three? To protect a route in Django, all you have to do is add a decorator. It's not even one line of code, it's just one word. You put one word above your route and it's protected. Boom, done. Stupid. Stupid easy. All we need to do is put a decorator in there and our route is protected. It's so stupid. It's one of the benefits of using something like Django. Yeah, it's a lot bigger application, but you have all this fun stuff built in. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Last thing we're going to talk about today is inheritance. Okay, Inheritance, we've talked about before. We've seen this. With vehicles, I think we made, uh, or with cars, we made, for vehicles, we did cars and planes last time. Here, we're going to make dogs and show dogs. 
Okay. You're going to meet Winky, the show dog. Okay. Using inheritance, a subclass is automatically going to inherit all of the attributes and methods of its superclass. The subclass can then define additional attributes or methods to make a more specialized class than the superclass. Where have we used this before? Every day in unit two. Well, at least three quarters of the days in unit two. Where, what have we seen? What, what class did we inherit from and then add properties to? Models. Models. We took all of the methods and properties associated with a mongoose model and then added our own fields to it so, so that our movies could have titles and cast properties and or performers and release year and MPAA rating. But they also have methods and properties associated with being a mongoose model, like find by ID and update or find or find by ID and delete. Okay. That's inheritance. Model is the super class. And then the whatever specialized version of that that we compile it into is our subclass, our movie, our flight, our taco. Okay. In JavaScript, we specialize the vehicle by extending it to create a plane. Here, we're going to create a show dog that specializes the dog class. Okay, so to do that, let's make a new class. Show dog. Okay, and notice here that we pass as a parameter dog. So show dog will inherit from dog. We pass in the super class as an argument. And then we're going to put all the parameters we need. We still need our def dunder init. And we have to pass the same things in. Okay. What did we do here in JavaScript? Does anybody remember? Be wildly impressed if you remember this. Super. Remember super? No, it's okay. Self, name, age equals zero. And we're going to add total earnings so we can track how much money Winky has or whatever you name your show dog. Such a stupid example. I'm interested to rewrite this shit. Winky the show dog. All right. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what? We've already done this part. We already know what age and name are coming from. So let's take our dog class that we passed in and init self, name, and age. What does this do? This runs this dog dot dunder init runs the init method on a dog, which does what? First off, gives us our ID because we have ID. That's part of the, the dog thing. It increments our ID. It takes care of that. It gives the dog a name, an age, an ID. So this takes care of all of our initial properties, okay, here. Then, once we have our dog built, we're going to add in total earnings so that we can see how much Winky's made. That's a sentence. We'll also give Winky add prize money, self, and amount. And we're going to say self 
plus or self dot total earnings plus equals amount. So now we're able to pay Winky. Winky can win money. Okay. If we wanted to give Winky the ability to spend prize money, we could do def uh, spend prize money self amount self dot total earnings minus equals amount. Okay. It's showtime. Okay. We're taking Winky to the dog show. Okay. Let's say Winky. <laughs> so stupid. Winky equals show dog. Okay. Named Winky. Winky's three years old. And Winky has a thousand dollars. Okay. So let's print Winky. Dog named Winky is three years old. Okay. Perfect. We inherited that overridden string. Just exactly what we wanted. What else do we need to do here? Let's test out our prize money. Well, actually, why don't we see if Winky can bark? Bark, Winky, bark. Woof. Winky can bark. So Winky has inherited the ability to bark from the original dog class. Let's see how much money Winky has. Let's print Winky.total earnings. You see, Winky has $1,000. Okay. Let's say Winky wins some money. Okay. Winky dot add prize money. Uh, let's say Winky just won $10,000. Okay. Winky's rich now. Let's also print total earnings after Winky wins some money. Okay. We see that Winky has won $10,000 more now. So Winky has $11,000. Let's say after the great dog show, Winky goes to McDonald's and eats some cheeseburgers. Okay. Everybody knows that the prices at McDonald's have skyrocketed lately. So let's say Winky eats three cheeseburgers. That's what, like... 40 bucks now, it's stupid. McDonald's is wildly expensive. So we'll do winky.spend prize money. We'll say winky spend, we'll call it, well, let's say 45. Winky's going to get some fries too. Winky's a fat little piece of shit. Okay. Oh my God. So we print winky total earnings. And we see now that Winky spent $45 on McDonald's, along with probably a heart condition, Winky only has $10,955 left. Cool. Rich. I'm just confused about what, uh, oh, by the way, a few more dog shows and maybe you can get your Acura. Uh, <laughs> But, that, uh, that winky that would belong to Winky technically. Dogs can't drive yet. <laughs> uh, I'm just confused about this language here, where it says always call the superclasses in it first. It, it means first relative to what? What this means is our dog, our show dog. When we make a new show dog, we've already written the code to add the properties for name and age to a dog, right? That code exists here. When, when we initialize a dog for the first, not a show dog, but a regular dog, we take the name and the age and we initialize them to make a new dog object. Dog dictionary. 
So this code exists to serve that purpose inside of the dog class. So rather than rewrite all of that here and say def dunder init self name age zero self dot name equals name self dot age equals age self dot we can just say hey we've already done that okay but the important thing the important reason why this is used here is because there's more than just defining the name and the age here we're also doing this this whole id thing if i print winky's id what's winky's id going to be Should be what three because i have two other dogs here so winky's id is three so we've inherited the fact that we are giving each dog a unique id from this method so we're getting all the fun stuff that we did up here by saying hey go run that thing that init method that we have on dog to set up the basics of a dog. And then once we've done that, once we have our dog, we can add total, total earnings to it and these additional methods. It's also why Winky can bark. Because we set that up here. Make sense? Matt. Uh, I have a quick question and um, it's not because what I wrote didn't work, but I'm wondering if uh, like how to necessarily break it. May I share my screen? Cause I added Please. something. I, um, my grandfather had a show dog and I, the whole time I've been thinking about how they had show names as well, because uh, he had sure. a dog named Everett and the show name was forever young. So Aww. when I did the initial, right. <laughs> When I did the init or the dunder init, um, I added everything. And then of course I added show name. We did the init with self name age, which was already in dog. You should Does it matter what flip. order these are in? Flip these. Oh my gosh, you're so right. So it definitely matters what order that's in, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. That does answer my question partially. Does that matter at me now? Uh, why is that mad at you? Does it not? Yeah, why is that mad at you? Hover over it. Because that should be okay. Non-default argument follows default argument. Oh, can I not? Like, do all defaults have to be grouped together? Because... That's fun. Because it's weird. It appeared to work normally, like I, when it was ordered the different way, but I'm sure like maybe that's a fluke here and it wouldn't necessarily it's, work everyone's. It, it, technically, it's just a syntactical thing. The problem is, is that if you switch the order of those around, you're going to have to, you would be defining a show dog differently than defining a regular dog because you're putting your parameters in a different order. But According to what Python is telling us here, you have to have all of your non-default parameters at the, or your all of your default value parameters at the end, which makes sense because mm -hmm. if you're going to leave things off, you have to expect that they're going to be at the end. That makes logical sense. I understand that. So the way you had it, it's actually better. But does it might, so does it know it to shuffle confusing. it in like that? Uh, well, it doesn't necessarily know to shuffle it in. It's just using parameters here. Like okay. it's parameters and arguments. You're calling the init method with uh, arguments that are being set up as parameters here. So technically there's nothing wrong with this. I just, I, usually you're gonna see things in the right or in the same order. That's not feasible here because you're setting multiple things with default parameters. So interesting. what so you did is, an interesting is fun. Little... Cool, I'm glad that I was able to show a weird thing. Yeah, um, no, I love it. Classes are a lot of fun when you really like, get into them and like start digging and like start playing around with this stuff. You can do a lot of really cool shit, but we don't really get to, we, we only kind of scratch the surface. Okay.
Python has a built-in type hierarchy with classes, okay? These are all classes that we see in Python, okay? Numbers aren't just numbers. They're integer numbers. You can have a long integer, or you can have a regular integer, a long integer, a, a Boolean sort of thing. You can have floats that are numbers, complex numbers, okay? There are all sorts of different things built into Python's type hierarchy. While this is cool, it's not as applicable as this line right here. Okay. Frameworks like Django and Rails have elaborate hierarchies of their own. When we use Django, we're going to be defining models like this. We're literally going to say class cat models dot model. So models is a, essentially something that we can inherit from where there is a model class. So we're going to be able to extend a subclass from a superclass this would be the subclass, this would be the superclass, and inherit everything from models.model, i.e. methods that give us the ability to do all of the things, and then add our own specific methods and properties for a person, or a dog, or a cat. Really cool. We don't need to like install a library for that either. We had to install Mongoose to get this to work last time. This is built into Django, it just comes with it. Okay? We're not going to install any extra libraries. Django has everything. But remember, we had to install Express. We had to install Method Override. We had to install .env. We had to install uh, Mongoose. We had to install JWT. We had to install Google OAuth, Passport, Bcrypt, Express Session, all of that shit we had to install. None of that in Django. We set up a Django project, has all that stuff built in already. Does that kind of relate to that original metaphor when we were like first introduced to MongoDB versus Django, where it was like Django is like a perfectly organized meal prepped bridge, and then MongoDB is a bit like a hoarder nightmare? That's and... you're you're switching SQL. Oh, but, SQL. But me, yes, SQL SQL is the nice, neat, organized like tables and rows and everything has its place and mongodb is a hoarder situation so but, is it kind of like yeah. all of those built-in things make it that organized already and with like mongodb we have to add all of that stuff to organize the hoarder nightmare the or better analogy here is the difference between what we call a, an opinionated framework and an unopinionated framework express which is what we used in unit two and unit three to build our back end is unopinionated we can set things up however we want. Express is like, hey, here are some basic rules to build a server. Other than that, throw in what you want. You want this library? Use it. Cool. You want to use MongoDB? Cool. Here you go. You want to use Postgres? Cool. Go use that library. But you have to do the work to get those libraries. If you want to use method override, I don't know what method override is. You have to install that. If you want to use a session based auth, you got to use expression, express sessions. I don't know what that is. Okay, it's very unopinionated. You can do things your way. It doesn't have an opinion as to how you need to do things. Django is ultra opinionated. Okay, Django is like, no, if you're going to do this, here's the rules on how you do this. You don't get to do it your way. You do it my way. Okay, with auth, if you want to use auth, if you want to protect a route, you don't get to write your own special code to do that. You use the decorator that I have as code within me as Django. That's how you do auth. If you want to write a route, this is how you write it. Okay, Django has very specific rules. That's why it's called an opinionated framework. And it's one of the reasons that I really like teaching it because it's completely different than what we've learned already. Okay, David doesn't like teaching Django. And I, we actually talked about this last night with him because we were talking about like general, uh, just peek behind the curtain. Like we were talking about how GA is structured and like, how they do things in different markets. Like the UK does things very differently than we do here. And we were talking about his not liking to teach Django because he thinks like it's, it's a lot. And I was like, yeah, it is a lot. But the, the, the value that you get there is you get to see the difference between something that's opinionated and something that's not opinionated. And there's not really a way to demonstrate that unless we really just like absolutely dive off the deep end into or yeah, dive into the deep end of 
a very opinionated web framework, which is what Django is. Some of you are going to love Django because it makes doing things really easy. Okay, You can stub up a highly secure web app in a very short amount of time with Django, and you can build something very quickly. The problem is, to do that, you need to follow all of Django's rules. And if you don't know what those rules are, you're screwed. So it's all about reading documentation. If you aren't good at reading documentation, <laughs> it's gonna be a doozy of a unit four for you. Because you're gonna read, you're gonna have to read. Reading is fundamental. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But you're going to hear me say multiple times a day during every Django lesson. When someone asks, well, why do we have to do it that way? It's like, because that's what Django t tells us to do. I don't, I don't get to write those rules. You don't get to write those rules. Django tells us how to do these things. We have to follow Django's rules. Okay? Some of you will love that. Some of you will hate that. It's always the way it goes. Any questions? Let's talk about these questions. We'll finish these questions here. Okay, I'll read them out, then I'll get the picker out. We have uh, five, six. So three of you will get away this morning without having to answer a question. So here are the questions. What's the difference between a class and an object? What Python keyword is used to, to define a class? How do we create objects using a class? True or false, class attributes are shared by all instances of that class. Class attributes are shared by all instances of that class. That's a... I don't like that question. Um, I think I deleted that last time. I'm going to delete that question because I think it's confusing. What do we have in here? They're intended to be, but technically, okay, never mind. We'll, we'll leave it. And then what object-oriented principle refers to subclasses specializing superclasses? Okay. So first question, what's the difference between a class and an object? Josh. Um, it's hard to kind of hard to articulate this. I guess uh, the class is kind of like the blueprint for what will be created, and then the uh, object, I guess, is just the instance of that class. Yeah, is that the best? Class way is used it? to create an object. Exactly. Cool. Love it. What Python keyword is used to define a class? Nat. Is it class? Or yeah. is it definite? Oh, okay, class. class. <laughs> I had to say, oh, uh, yeah. gosh, wait. Feels too yeah. easy. Cool. No. Cool. How do we create objects using a class? Asa. God, you got to give me the, the more detailed one. Um, uh, isn't it with instances? Uh, with create, create object with instances. Um, Okay. Like, do you want like an actual description of how to do it, like in code-wise? or One word. One word. Two words, technically. The second word being it. You just invoke it. Oh, invoke it. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I was I was confused a little bit by that question. I got you. True or false? Class attributes are shared by all instances of that class. Great. Uh, true. See, I would go either way on this one. Because we set up here that... Class instances are intended to be accessed. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. Instance attributes are in, in, intended to be accessed by instances of the class, whereas class members are accessible by the class itself, not on instances. But we kind of demonstrated the opposite, where technically we had access to it and Again, I think this is kind of a technically weird worded question. Um, I would buy your answer. I would buy both answers because I think that this is a confusing. I'm going to get rid of this question. This is a dumb question. 
confusing. We're good. Free pass, you win. What object-oriented principle refers to subclasses specializing superclasses? Sean. Inheritance. Inheritance, perfect. Love it. Um, if you want practice on this, you can do this extra exercise where you create a bank account class and play around with it. And then you can create a savings account that subclasses the bank account just for fun. It's a good exercise. We used to do that as an exercise in class, but we just don't have time for that anymore. That's a good way to practice this. Okay. Ninety six percent of the code we used in this lesson, you're not going to see again. I just want to be clear on that. We're going to be inheriting from the model class, and that's the important thing to know for this. So don't get obsessed with this. OK. Cool. That's all I've got. I'm going to shut Zoom down because after lunch, we're going to go to outcomes and I will see you at outcomes where I will teaching you be teaching you how to get through a technical interview. It's going to be a fun one. Have fun.